So um, welcome everyone. This is the fifth in the series of Inspire webcasts. And um, I'm really excited about this one. I know I said that about the other one, but I definitely think this is going to be the uh, second best one of the five that we've had so far. Let's see if we can get it up and uh, top it. You probably already know who Richard Browning is. That might be one of the reasons that you're uh, dialing in. But if you don't, I'm just going to move back so you can just see this uh, little clip of him and his colleagues up to some of their act, um, antics. Welcome. Hi there. Um, just so that you know, the uh, majority of the audience is for EOH. This is a series that I've been running with them. Um, and a massive thanks to Stephen Van Collar for allowing me to do that. That's their SEO today. It's a bit different. We actually have got some guests who are coming in from outside of EOH as well. Um, and the theme for me is that you've just, you, I mean, hmm, how do you start? I think you're crazy. At least if I hadn't met you, I would think that you were crazy. If we look at what you're doing there in the backdrop, no one in their right mind wakes up one day and says that they're going to make themselves this Iron Man rocket suit. Why did you do this? Yeah, it, it's a question you won't be surprised to hear that I have been asked before, uh, despite this now being three and a bit years into the journey. And, you know, as I was sharing with you earlier, this is... Uh, uh, we've now delivered over 100 events in 30 separate countries. We've got a team of a dozen people and we're scaling towards a race series. I mean, it, it's kind of a remarkable journey, if I may say so myself, that I never quite envisaged. And the starting point was very innocent. I, I was an oil trader with BP for 16 years. I joined the Royal Marines Reserve alongside my day job. My whole family background was from the world of aeronautics and innovation and engineering. But I have to say that uh, oil trading career, if you like, didn't really point at where I have now ended up. So to, to try and justify the, the, the background, I suppose, it, you know, in my corporate life, I had gone off down a number of different avenues and explored some quite innovative things. We, I think you want to talk about some of those later. Um, I think in my childhood, I really enjoyed the design, uh, building, taking things apart, messing in my late father's workshop. I used to build model gliders and all this kind of stuff. And, and my grandfather's, one was a pilot and one was uh, the CEO of Westland Helicopters, now, Le now Leonardo. Uh, and my father was a, an aeronautical engineer as well, a maverick inventor and designer. So obviously they influenced me heavily around, I suppose, what, how do I describe it? The innovator's journey, the, the having an idea, daring to imagine it might work, trying to survive all the setbacks and failures, pivoting where you need to, and every now and then getting to the summit of that journey and realizing it was all worth it. That journey, right? So I, I know I always had that in me. Um, so if I wind the clock forward to 2016, I'd been deeply kind of enamored with what the Royal Marines had taught me around human capability, about setting yourself a physical or mental challenge and going further than you, know, you thought possible. Anybody listening to this that does triathlons or running or any kind of fitness or training, you know, we've all been there. Yeah? Sometimes, sometimes you go further than you quite imagined you could. So when it came to flight, I thought, if I can hold myself in a bunch of sort of gymnastic positions, a bit like sort of the planche and things like that, you know, some of these, they're, it's all very popular now, these sort of... Um, you know, in a kid's play park holding a flag and things. You see it a lot on, online. So in a very amateur way, I got into that alongside my day job. I'd take a break from trading and go to the gym next to the trading floor in Canary Wharf. And I sort of got into that, that kind of uh, training. And, I, and I, I thought, if I could hold myself in those positions, what if I swap out the momentary support of a bar or the floor for a form of propulsion? Uh, you know, no, no logical reason whatsoever to go and really do this. I had no idea of building a business. Uh, and in 2016, I started playing around. And yeah, you found some of the clips here. It was perfect timing. There was the first test with one engine. And that dismissed most of the assumptions as to why it wouldn't work. And I went from one engine to two engines and then jumping around a field. You'll see. There you go. Um, and it was remarkable because actually, whilst, yes, they're 1,000 horsepower, well, the whole suit ended up with 1,000 horsepower. Each one of those engines is about 170 horsepower. Um, whilst they're crazy and loud and there's lots of heat and whatever, you know what? It's manageable. If you experiment and learn from safe failure, and safe meaning I only fell from a few feet, I mean, even here was trying with a tether, didn't work at all though. I actually fumbled my way over about eight months working very late nights and weekends alongside that day job, 
to a point where I actually got, got it to fly, which we'll see that clip um, at some point. I think in this, there's been so many edits. Along soon, um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, and, and you know what? It was just one of those, you know, childlike kind of dreams of wouldn't it just be so cool if you could design the minimalist amount of equipment to just augment the already pretty awesome human brain from a balance point of view? Walking is nuts when you think about it, or let alone wheeling around like the kid in the background there. Um, and the human body is strong enough to support itself in a variety of positions. Why not just try and you know achieve the supposedly impossible? Uh, and it was just too much of a tantalising thing. So I mean, that so to be clear, I'm going to have to pick you up. I, I'm going to have to pick you up on the rocket thing. So they're, they're jet engines. They're, they're centrifugal compressor gas turbines. So they're very similar, apart from the centrifugal compressor bit, to the gas turbines you'd have um, on a jet plane of any kind. Not rockets. Rockets, they used to use rockets 20 years ago. Terrifying, even worse than what I do. <laughs> um, and not the same. But yeah, where did I get them from? So the world of um, kind of gun target drones and uh, very large model aircraft had kind of uh, it quietly scaled in the background whilst the big engine manufacturers had obviously gone for bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more efficient gas turbines for power generation and uh, civil airliners the world of small ones had kind of been left behind and so actually it's hobbyists who had worked out that especially using microprocessor you know computer control to bring the engine rapidly up to, up to the temperature and thereafter manage this Frank Whittle-esque if people know who he is Frank Whittle-esque type balance of not blowing up and not shutting down, that's really hard, but it's perfect for a computer that can keep modulating the fuel very precisely. Um, that had all just gone crazy, and I had a hunch that they'd got sophisticated enough to be able to manage this. And we get them modified nowadays, but in the early days, they were somewhat off the shelf, albeit an unusual shelf. And then um, what sort of brought you into that? Let's go back to the idea stage, the first moment it's popped into your head and you've started to think about using these uh, mini gas turbines. How long did it take? How, what was that journey like? Yeah, so I think this, this is an important and relevant point, I think certainly to, to kind of large organizations, if I may say, from my experience in BP. I, I, I used to sit on airplanes traveling around the world for my, my day job, and I had a sketchbook with me, and I used to just sketch all these ideas. And frankly, that was the easy bit and the fun bit. Going from those sketches to actually coughing up some money, some real money, and actually spending some real time cutting a piece of aluminium tube to the right length of my arm, working out that it hugged my arm okay, putting a hand grip in it, and then buying one of these engines. And after bench testing it and understanding how to control it, actually standing in that lane that you see in one of those clips. The, the, the walking the walk bit, not just talking or meeting and discussing and drawing pictures, the actual physical, tangible, making an ideal real, that was a big step. But what I was familiar with from my other forays into the sort of innovation world, I knew that almost to convince myself I was serious about this, I had to make the idea physical. Even as crude as it was, that, that journey of standing in the lane and realizing that the thrust was actually spongy and manageable. And the 120,000 RPM gyroscopic effect surprisingly was nil. And it's because the rotating mass is so small, but conventional wisdom was that that would never be controllable. Probably rip my arm off and I'd disappear into a ball of flame. Actually, none of that. Um, so it, it's about making the idea real. Did you know about that potential massive problem before you started experimenting and yeah drafting? yeah I, I did I, I mean I grew up around uh, you know uh, aeronautical engineers as I described and I could probably describe to you at age 10 how a helicopter works with the swash plate and everything um, so I, I knew enough to be bold enough to go and have a go but actually probably luckily not enough to know that it was supposed to be impossible um, and, and I think that's an important thing you, you know I'm sure you you've covered this kind of subject before and your audience will be familiar with this, but this idea of bringing in near experts, the idea of people that, that, that <laughs> almost know enough to be dangerous. So in other, in other words, they're not, they haven't got 20, 30 year careers in their subject matter, but they know enough to just come in and disrupt. So there's a wonderful NASA story of cracking some big sort of astronomical maths problem. And it was some retired telecoms engineer, you know, in his seventies. Uh, who just like submitted the crowdsourced uh, uh, answer and he just innocently meandered from a direction that no one had thought of before into the problem. So by me not being a sort of 20 year experienced gas turbine engineer kind of allowed me to go, well, I don't see why you can't have one strapped to your arm. <laughs> okay, so that's kind of the first lesson. So we've got some level of ignorance is a good thing if you're looking at innovation because it makes sense, doesn't it? If you know everything, then it's hardly going to be easy for you to step outside and think of different yeah. ways to do it. Okay, exactly. So yeah, yeah. and I was just going to add to that that, that often you know, I, I acknowledge that 
that those pathways with a signpost mark don't go down here. It's stupid. It's ridiculous. It's never going to work. It's going to be a waste of time, waste of money. You know, yes, most of the time those signposts are correct. But if you've got the balls to go and push that sign apart uh, to one side and carefully walk down that path, down that path will be all the big breakthroughs that no one ever imagined possible. You know, you, you, can, you, you can list pretty much every scientific or technology or business breakthrough as being initially ludicrous. I mean, think of Airbnb and walking into the Hilton management's boardroom and going, I've got this idea, we're all going to share each other's bedrooms. It's not quite like that, I know. But, you know, it got laughed out. I mean, it was just never even entertained. And yet, look what happened. You know, for every probably 50 of those mad ideas, yeah, probably 49 were stupid. But look, you know, you've got to be open-minded to the seemingly impossible. Otherwise, you're just fettling otherwise the known, known technology. Anyway. Best ideas are laughable. Now, there's a huge amount of resistance when you go down this particular path. Clearly, most of the people, when you are sketching it and starting to go and build these things and they, you're chatting to them, experts or others must have just been shaking their head and just saying you know why well look it doesn't affect us because it's not necessarily mm -hmm. in a company environment but nonetheless I'm, I'm glad i'm not having to go and fund this particular initiative right so so a, a big facilitator of this a was that i didn't tell very many people about it i mean i was i was a you know a serious a respectable you know a corporate executive running a big trading book um and i genuinely didn't know if this was going to work at all i might just end up just backtracking and sticking some jet engines on one of my kids' bikes and convincing myself that that would be a good application of the technology I discovered. Um, so I didn't know it was going to work. I didn't enroll very many people at all. And actually, it was one of the, the joys, really, that actually pretty much all of it was within my gift. If I'd had to enroll a team of 20 people and probably hire them and all that sort of stuff, the barrier to me of going down this route would have been too much. And I think to draw a corporate analogy, your experiments and forays into the unusual have got to be rapid and they've got to be cheap. Otherwise, you just can't justify the resource, um, you know, resource requirements. And I, I think this is, a, this is a Google X Astro Teller kind of quote, I think. But, you know, you've got to absolutely fail fast. It's a cheesy thing to say, but no, you've got to have a quick go, kill the idea or quickly realize it's great and then put more resources in it not a 12 month program and millions of dollars later because it's just too embarrassing to realize, yeah, it doesn't work. So I, I made very rapid uh, progress through these ideas uh, as cheaply as I could, repurposing things like the uh, trigger off an electric drill uh, I used as a throttle trigger because guess what, it was perfect and I had a broken electric drill and I ripped the trigger out of it. Um, the structure of the early stage jet suits, these things in the background here, they're all 3D printed now. In the early days, I used to use child carrying rucksacks. You know, you take a kid for a hike, you know, five-year-old for a hike or three-year-old, whatever, you put them in a big backpack on your back. Well, I realized that actually that's a wonderful structure to carry the equipment. Now, to be clear, the, the climbing harness structure was built through it. So that was what was holding me when I was in, when I was in the air. But in terms of why bother re-engineering a comfortable load-bearing structure, you know, for $150 or so, you can buy something that's been beautifully engineered to carry a not dissimilar weight. Fascinating. So rapid, it's got to be uh, cheap. What did you do from your mindset to, um, to start to try to find ways to ignore the detractors? Yeah, so, yeah, so I, I didn't talk to too many people, but I, I, knew, I knew what they would say. And I later on, only some six months after I launched the company and I started this crazy march around the world doing talks and things, um, I had a, a genuinely a professor at the Italian Institute of Technology, wonderful guy, he was a Brit actually, who stood up during my talk and said, there is no way that this should work. The rotating spindle should fight you perpendicular to the angular momentum where you try to manipulate it. And we just had a little bit of a friendly giggle because all his students in the room were like, yeah, but it does. I just flew it in their, in their parking lot earlier. Um, and it's funny, and the, the actual reality is because the rotating mass out of, uh, away from the shaft is so tiny, you don't sense it. But he was adamant, he was boggling his mind. He'd spent a career working out, actually back to electric drills, how to try and reduce that torque kick when you let go of the trigger. Um, but look, I, I, I have this attitude. Look, I'll acknowledge the concerns about what could go wrong. I'll absolutely scrutinize the ones that could hurt me or somebody else. Absolutely. But once I'm satisfied myself that I understand the risk and I can mitigate that risk, like I'll bench test the engine first, I'll feel where the heat is. I will put some protection in case the worst happens with the engine, which is a blade off uh, environment, you know, blade off uh, situation. Once I've covered off all of those, I just got to try this and I've got to try it in a steady, gentle way where I can back out of it at any moment. You know, it's very physical what I'm describing here, holding a jet engine as you spool it up, but, it, but this can apply to a business model in a corporate. 
every stage, what's the worst that can happen and is it recoverable? Can I get back up again from a safety, reputation and financial point of view? Genuinely, those are the rules we run here. Yes, we take risk and you can see this all over, all over our Instagram and LinkedIn and lots on YouTube at the moment. But we take risk, but at every single stage, we do our absolute best to go, look, can I recover from this? And in other words, most of the time, could I fall from that height, mostly into water? And will I be okay? If it's, yeah, it's going to hurt a bit and I'll be bruised for a bit, but I'll get better. Then you know what? In the pursuit of innovation, we'll take that risk. But anything worse than that, no way. So safety, financial and, and regulatory. I, think, I find that fascinating. It's such good advice for corporates. Run experiments, not because you think that they're going to be successful. Run them because you're aware of the downside risks and you can manage them and you believe that therefore that they're safe. Well, and, and, and also, as long as the cost in every sense of time and money um, of experimenting with something isn't too great, it, it liberates you to try the most ludicrous of things. I've got a lot of these around this lab. Um, and actually, from a corporate point of view, you know, why not have a go? Because the number of times we've tried something where we thought, you know, it's probably just not going to work. And the number of times that hasn't worked, but it's shed a light on something else that makes you think, well, hang on a minute. I never would have thought of that. If I hadn't physically witnessed this happening, I never would have thought about that. And, and I, I often think that it, it also starts to engender a culture of not being afraid to fail carefully and cheaply. It, it, it grows that confidence in that culture. You know, you wade around amongst many things that don't work. And what does this sound like? It sounds like a kid playing with Lego. Most of their things fall apart, don't work, but every now and then they'll build something kind of beautiful or they'll build the confidence to fail their way towards something like that. Did you have a, a clear plan? I mean, you mentioned earlier that um, a lot of it was just experimenting and you weren't totally sure where, where it was going. I'm kind of answering your question for you, I suppose. I've got one to follow it. But when you started, was there at least some sort of direction? And did you end up yeah, so started it, going? Really, as simple as if I can hold my, with just my hands, I can support my body weight in some unusually difficult planche-like gymnastic positions. That bodes well. Um, I could add up on paper how many gas turbines I'd need of a certain spec to lift me. I'd add up the weight of them and the weight of the fuel to fly for a few minutes. And on paper, that worked. So it was a simple challenge, in theory, of marrying up human with the lift, <laughs> but doing it in a way, well, there's a critical rule here, doing it in a way that strayed away from building a big box with a seat and a, and a button that said hover, and with a load of gyros and ECUs and computers, and all you've done is built a big, fancy, probably quite dangerous drone that might go wrong and hurt you, and you're not doing anything. I wanted to stay in a much more authentic, augment the human form kind of thing, kind of, kind of ethos. I wanted to just keep it simple. Not only because that made, I could, meant I could build it more simply, but also I thought it was more elegant, and also I honestly thought it was more safe. Because when I'm thundering around with a thousand horsepower jet suit now, I know the worst that can happen is I get a failure and I simply drop. I don't rock it up into the air and then suddenly, you know, it all goes and it overspins and whatever. So that was the challenge. Where the hell do you put this thrust? Do you all put it on your feet, on your legs, on your back? I mean, on a big stalk above your head and wear a little pointy hat to keep the exhaust. I mean, honestly, I had a completely blank piece of paper. And some of those clips you showed earlier, again, there's loads of this on the YouTube, uh, were examples of, of me experimenting. And, you know, things like putting them on the legs, that turned out to work to an extent, but created a load of problems. So... Yes, I had a broad plan, but actually a huge amount of deliberate freedom to not get pigeonholed down one route. And I felt the pressure because as soon as you feel something kind of half working, you think, well, I'll just keep tweaking that rather than having the patience, if you like, to back completely out of it and go, but hang on a minute. I, am I, am I, have I dr disappeared down one of those decision terrains? Have I got caught in a valley? Can I not lift myself back out to a high point from the sort of computer modeling point of view? And actually realize there's an even better one just over there. It was kind of, it, it was kind of quite tough, I'd say. But yeah, I did have a broad plan. Uh, avoiding detractors but, and doing it solo. I don't think everyone can um, do it solo. If you can find your sweet spot, that's great. How important was it to find supporters? How many supporters did you get? Yeah, so, so um, uh, I had a sort of core team of about four or five of us, uh, including my, my main weakness was doing some of the coding required to control the engines in the way we needed. Um, so I managed to sort of emotionally enroll a small squad of people who were also equally tantalized by the possibility of this working. Again, they did it all in their free time evenings and weekends. And, and that was kind of lovely in a way, because actually at every stage, it was the wonderful acid test of were they actually genuinely heartfelt committed. But as soon as, and I know this is not a helpful comment from a, for a corporate 
uh, to hear. But as soon as you start paying somebody, <laughs> where is their motivation? Is their heart really in it? Because it's going to be disguised by their necessity to pay the rent. <laughs> now, again, that's not a helpful comment, but just, just it's worth noting that when you've got people collaborating around you, and I mean, I've got a you know, paid for team of a decent number of people now, but a wider team that include you know, the former F-35 chief, te chief test pilot from Edwards Air Force Base in the US, a whole raft of fast jet pilots and helicopter pilots. We've got the most amazing network of people. None of them are paid. And I know they only show up to our events and help out at training and just, just hang out at our lab because they're just genuinely passionate about what I do. And that does bring with it such an energy that if I'm really honest, is such in a contrast to the typical experience you, you have in a large organization. It's so hard to maintain that kind of startup buzz in such a big organization and it's just worth noting anything you can do to try and stoke that you know it, it, it's it's so valuable so let's talk about that emotional um enrollment because it is such an important piece just asking you directly when you've been looking to employ or bring technical minded people and you've needed specific skill sets how have you weighed up the value that they're going to bring is it uh lots of tests and uh, lots of interviews, you know, a very formulaic process, 10, you know, separate sessions, go off and do something. Yeah. Or is it the emotion that's driven um, that, yeah, let's just give it a go. Where, where so, do you so, yeah, in, in the early days, uh, I mean, this still happens now and it's just so tough because we just don't have the capacity, but you know, right from the off when we launched in April, 2017, and we, we like scored a billion impressions globally across every media platform you can imagine, everything from including North Korean TV news, I was quite delighting in. Anyway, um, we were just inundated with people saying, oh my God, I've got to be part of this, how can I get involved? And so what, what I did wherever possible, and I was obviously biased to people who, who were not too far away from where we are, you know, within a few hours drive, I just said, look, come along, hang out at one of our testing sessions, come to an event in California or Gold Coast, Australia, or, you know, where I met you in Johannesburg, you know, I said it to some people that were, when I met you, um, you know, honestly, just, just, just come to an event, see what we do, hang out, kind of just try and be useful. And it's the most easy non-committal way from both sides. Some people, you show them a zip tie and they're all fingers and thumbs and they just don't know what to do. Um, other people, you know, immediately just sink straight into knowing how they can help and how they can get involved. Um, other people, you know, maybe they're not so practical, but actually they're brilliant at helping you know, guide how we edit some of our footage or, you know, there's so many different ways that people can slot in. And, and, you know, I had it drilled into me when I was in the corporate world, you know, diversity, diversity, diversity of people. And, you know, if I'm really honest, it often felt quite hollow and as a little bit of a marketing kind of thing. Actually, I am a massive believer in diversity. I want the most peculiar team possible. I want somebody to come in and go, look, actually, I can barely use this. You know, I was joking about zip ties. It's a, it's a sort of internal joke here. It's amazing what you can achieve with zip ties. Um, but you know what? Actually, somebody who was pretty uh, practically useless, you know, in the heat of the moment for an event, there was a number of times where some of these people I'm thinking of have literally got white as a sheet and frozen. You know, the heat of three million people watching on TV. Oh my God, something's not igniting. Right, get this, do this, unclip this, whatever. You know, it's pretty intense. Yeah, it's like being back in the military. They were useless in that scenario. But oh my God, were they insightful about how to edit a YouTube video? So actually, having such a, an unusual collection of people was really powerful. So. To answer your question properly, the process was having people just show up and I'd be able to judge where they would fit and where they'd have a role. And actually, you know, we've had the luxury of having most people who now work for me as a paid engagement did their first three, six months or so about sort of part time showing up just out of a passion project. And yeah. they were so good and they got so familiar with working how we work and I could see where they fitted in. It was just a no brainer. It became natural. That we're like, oh, we, we should really reward you for this. Is it going to be difficult to maintain that, um, that time of structure as you get bigger, obviously, with all of the impressions that you're only going one way and that's up? The, yeah. the formalities that you were able to ignore in those early years, are they starting to irk their way back into your organization? And if not, how are you defending yourselves from those? Yeah, I, I think this gets into an interesting conversation about how humans work in teams. Um, I, I think, is it, uh, is it North Face as a company that, that refuses to run teams of more, like, more than like 50 people or something? And as soon as they do that, they hive them off and then they don't, they, they're separate. Um, there's something about you know, humans able to lead and manage tribal groups of between 50 and I think sometimes 150. Funnily enough, it's the smallest field command scale unit of a company of men that you have in militaries all over the world you know that that's not by accident it comes down to tribal leadership you can roughly know ish 
the names and the personalities and the strengths and weaknesses of about 150 people if you had to. Beyond that, it becomes delegation. And as soon as it's delegation, I've lost that connection and that hands-on feel. Um, and it's very hard. I mean, mavericks like Richard Branson and people like that and Elon Musk are very good, I think, at engendering their personality culture, if you like, through an organization, which is about the best you can do. But in terms of a truly boundaryless, fleet of foot, energized, exciting place to work, yeah, as soon as you get anywhere near 150, more like over 50, I think it starts to get difficult. We're also very lucky in this weird day and age. You know, two of my best pilots are also two of my best uh, CAD designers and engineers. Um, I mean, what a joy. I, I, they, they've done a load of events even by themselves, packed off to China and do events, and they're only in their mid-20s. They come back and go, you know what? I reckon if we tw tweak the angle of one of those arm gas turbines, we might just take the load off, you know, uh, when you lift them out to pull a certain maneuver. It's like, well, go and have a go. You do the CAD design, we'll get it 3D printed, and then you can fly the results. How cool is that that so many of our team members are multi-purpose? It is not the design team who have to scrutinize the flight team about what the impact was of the latest design tweak. And just to put the icing on the cake, those two guys are brilliant at, at filming, uh, flying FPV drones and editing clips. I mean, how ridiculous. They then go and post on social media what we've just gone and tested. I mean, it's, I think multi-skilled small groups are just a massive you know, benefit. Huge benefit. Some questions that are coming in. Uh, let's just start through. Um, this one's from Nick Lett. Hey, Rich, did you assist? <coughs> I can't remember. Or did Marvel use your concepts when they designed Iron Man? <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so the similar answer is no, uh, but there's a fun story here. So, I, and I didn't look to be really clear. I know it looks a bit Iron Manny, but I didn't have that in mind at all when I started. It clearly looked increasingly like it, and I can't deny from a, you know, marketing, PR, and event, and you know, scaling the race series point of view, it's brilliant that it does. Uh, and it probably is about the closest that humanity's got to building a real life Iron Man suit, I guess. Um, the fun thing, though, relevant to this question is that the Marvel team or the team of creatives hired by Marvel to do the CGI of the first film where, if you remember, the Tony Stark character is kind of learning and balancing and where he does it like a backflip and crashes into all those lovely exotic cars in his lab. His version, much nicer version of what I've got here. Um, there's, no, there's no Ferraris hanging around here, unfortunately. Um, that team reached out to us just after we launched and delighted in the fact, and I've met them all, uh, delighted in the fact that what we'd gone and done had proven what they'd had to imagine to produce that CGI. Where you see Tony Stark kind of balancing like a little puppet with his legs and arms and then gradually gets it, looks up and grins and straightens up. You can see it in all the clips we've been doing. There is phases where every client we have goes through the same process. And I did when I first learned. So they were just losing their minds to the idea that they'd correctly guessed that the, the learning process wasn't too far off that. A mm. couple of questions. I'm going to hijack them slightly from Adam and, and Heinrich. It's, how do you deal with the regulatory legal aspects? And I think this is really interesting at the moment because most projects, I think, in corporates start with the wrong questions. You know, can we do this? What's the legislative framework? They almost look for reasons why it won't work. Really good, yeah. We've yes, got so there's there's been... doing autonomous cars. We've got um, um, who else? We've got Uber looking to go and do you know uh, autonomous drones for yeah. you know passengers. Huge risks, huge legislative um, issues. And if you worried about them at the start, then you wouldn't have actually so, started with Dev. You're in the same position. Yeah. How how did you go through that mentally? What how did you try to ignore it? So to begin with, we were very kind of subtle. We just didn't really put our heads above the parapet and I knew I had to kind of build a track record of proving that we were sensible and not a threat to people or property and therefore shouldn't be something that the regulator should worry about. So we sort of self-regulated, never flying over people or property and never going very high, never going over anywhere that was going to upset people. Out of 100 events, we've never upset anybody in any area that we know of. Um, but so to begin, we just built this kind of um, momentum. Then something interesting happened. We were invited to fly at the Farnborough Air Show. The Farnborough International Air Show, one of the biggest, it was every two years. You know, it's the showcase of military and uh, civil aviation. And the event organizer said, come and fly at our event, but we'll have to talk to the CAA, Civil Aviation Authority in the UK. They delightfully leaned in and I think Hart said, oh, this is great, we love all this because they're aviators at heart. Head said, oh my God, how does this fit with the regulation? They looked at their own regulations and realized that technically what I was doing was not a drone and it was not an aircraft. It was under 150 kilos, all up, you know, human and, and machine. It comes to about 120 if I'm about 75, 80. 
um, and uh, it doesn't have a fixed a fixed wing nor rotary wing. Therefore, it doesn't technically class as an aircraft. It technically is therefore not their concern. So they worked with the Farnborough Air Show folks and said, look, we'll also just go belt and braces. Before technically the air show runway opens, um, we'll have gravity do their flight. And it was an amazing, quite stressful to make sure it worked, but a couple of days of flying there. That then set the ball rolling. And since then, we've had the CAA, some of the senior leadership in the suit on the training rig flying and absolutely loving it. We've had the FAA uh, kind of support us as well and say, look, you're really an un unknown category. As long as you keep doing what you're doing and you're demonstrating online and you're not social media and events, you don't fly over property, you don't fly over people, you're not getting in the way of other aircraft, you barely fly higher than the street lighting, you know, and the only risk is to the pilot and it's a professional who's trained to do it, you're fine. And actually, they have been very flattering, both the CIA and the FAA, they've been very flattering in saying, yes, look, in a context where a lot of companies, often young folks in startups are building various assemblages of rotors and wings, to try and take people or parcels around the place, that is a nightmare to try and regulate. And it's so sad to see many of those startups build a brilliant prototype and then get told that they're never gonna be able to fly it anywhere near a city. It's very difficult. So we joyously can show up and fly. I've flown in downtown Singapore and where they, all they cared about was just taking my Mavic drone off me because they don't like drones, but the guy in the flying suit, ah, fine, <laughs> go for it. So it's a lot about building a reputation where people go, you know what, there's no rule to say you can, but there's also no real to say you can't. So it's a human judgment as to whether we're gonna, we're gonna trust you to do something for which there really isn't any regulation. So it's been a big lucky break. I think from a corporate point of view, getting a regulatory sandbox to play in. So the CAA have done this for some drone companies to create a sort of play area where within certain rules you can, you can do what you like. I think that's critical. Yeah, and I think that, uh, whatever you call it, stakeholder management, the first part really resonates with me where you do it under the radar, you do it small, you, you at least try to get enough data sets about whatever it is that you're trying to do and where you're mm -hmm. confident about it. And it's at that point you can start bringing in the regulators. Um, when yes. it's bigger. Getting them in at the start is always a bit dangerous because their natural tendency is say no. Right, uh, I absolutely fully agree. And there might be a little bit of an awkward, awkward phase where you get a bit of an unfortunate overlap between those two things, but you're completely right. If I'd just gone with some drawings to the CAA and said, can you give me a letter to say I can do this? I mean, when would have they have ever have said that? So yeah, yeah. it is tough. Um, and most regulators like the CAA are getting pretty good now, and it's all credit to them to create a space to allow innovation. Because if you really think about it, the senior management of these regulators they can sleep easy at night if they just banned everything, but they don't because they're sensible human beings and they accept that we've got to progress. Um, so wherever you find a regulator not doing that, I think it's, it's worth calling them out and saying, look, you've got to allow innovation. Good question here from Anton. Um, you look like a fairly uh, happy, bubbly uh, sort of character, but I'm assuming you've had some down days and dark days over the uh, development cycle here. Have you? And, and how do you pull yourself through it and pull yourself up? <laughs> yeah, no, very, yes, very, yes. I, I, that's a really good question because I get a bit sick, I have been sick in the past, of reading kind of innovation books about how just all you have to do is just have a complete blind face and faith and never give up and everything's brilliant. No, innovation is about spending most of your time a bit depressed that stuff isn't working out and questioning your sanity and whether you should stop and whether you should pivot. All you ever see though is people like me with backdrops like this where I've gone, oh look, it's worked. This is, this is one in a hundred of my things I've done in my life that just happens to have worked particularly well. Um, no, it's mostly about keeping sane during the troubling times and calling yourself out when you must stop and must pivot. You know, if you wanna get, I mean, I can, I can answer this question with a bit of a freight train, if you permit me. Um, my father killed himself when I was 15 from a failed entrepreneurial journey. He was a maverick inventor, designer, engineer, had a perfectly good day job, went it alone with a great idea about building mountain bike suspension. And it just so happens I picked up one of these from a wonderful guy who's in his 70s who just gave me one of his early prototypes he had in his garage. I don't usually have this hanging around. Anyway, over the course of three years, um, you know, I had it constantly as an only child that we were going to be millionaires and it was going to be brilliant. And, and then I witnessed his great lows. And eventually one of those great lows took me he lost it. I mean, he just took his own life when I was at boarding school. So I had the mother of all learning journeys around how, yeah, have an exuberant, crazy idea, give up the day job, go it alone, make, you know, go shoot for the stars, read the Richard Branson book kind of thing. But I had a really big lesson in how that often doesn't work out and how it can go catastrophically wrong. So back to what I said earlier, yes, take risk, even setting up your own business, but can you recover, you know, safety or let's say emotionally 
reputationally is it something that could get you in trouble and financially are you going to sink your financial security so for me i only opened the tap on my inner father if you like at the grand old age of what 39 38 when i built enough of a financial you know stability for my family to know that i wasn't doing this to just about pay the mortgage every month um, that's undoubtedly been a big benefit to me absolutely um and again i think we'll probably mention it again at least twice before the end only ever experiment if you're sure that it's not going to preclude your ability to run more experiments. Right. Uh, you know, for us, that is, that is, you know, flying to a thousand feet, seeing if a new parachute works. That, I, we just don't play with parachutes. We have done a few times, but because they just lead you into a world where failure means potential death. Uh, you know, people, people often look at what we do online and say, oh, why don't you just go to 5,000 feet? And it's like, well, there's nothing up there apart from massive risk. All the audiences, and even from a military and tactical point of view, it's much better to be lower, lower down. I mean, 20, 30 feet is more than enough. What's your number one tip for people, though? You know, when you're in those down moments, those butterfly moments, you know, where yeah. uh, your, your whole body is telling you that you're doing something which feels a, um, a little bit risky, it's not going to work, something's failed majestically, you're worried that you're going to hit your financial safety barriers, whatever it might be, what's the number one tip to pull yourself through that? Yeah, so for me... And I hope this isn't a woolly answer because this is, this, is, this is from the heart, this, this really, I suppose. It's actually having a portfolio of things going on in your life. You know, if you've got family, kids, um, you know, a, a hobby like, I don't know, running or uh, some other interest, you're learning a language or playing a musical instrument or you, you've got your day job. I used to think, I used to sort of split my life up into five or six buckets. And, you know, the mad one at the weekend where I go off and try and fly around with a bunch of jet engines, having spent most of the waking most of the sleeping hours during the previous week working on it during the night if i then had a terrible abysmal testing session on the saturday my family would look at me like what are you doing you look knackered you spent two hours setting this up and there was a small puff of blue smoke and we went home it's like what is going on and I, that would be exactly what i'd be thinking all i'd try and think about to try and cheer myself up is actually work's going okay or maybe my running's going quite well at the moment i'm looking forward to doing a little race in a few weeks that's going okay or you know my family don't hate me too much <laughs> that's going well I, I would feel like I just switched flies again. Well, at least they're doing all right. You know, that was my only mitigation. It, it, and I worry when I see some entrepreneurs who literally are sleeping on a couch and literally not doing anything other than the one startup. And there's nothing else in their lives, not even a relationship. You are 100% committed to that one thing and you're going to ride the ebbs and flows of that. Some people can do that. I think I would feel very vulnerable if I did that. Let's put it back into the, uh, the corporate context because this is actually the area where I get even more excited about. Can you tell us about your BP journey? Yeah, so and we, we, did, we had a brief chat about this before, didn't we? So, uh, you know, I was running a trading book, which in hindsight was a little bit like running your own business inside a big organization, uh, inside the safety net of a big organization. Uh, and also from an innovation point of view and a risk management point of view, it was like doing this in a way because I had to take constant risk, but each of those risks on aggregate have to be recoverable enough that you net end up, not down. So actually, trading like that or running an investment portfolio is a little bit like innovation i sort of suddenly realized but the the big kind of um story i suppose that is relevant here is the one that may be somewhat famous in the commodities world was discovering something called ais ship tracking automatic identification ship tracking so about 15 years ago or so the international maritime organization had told all the world's shipping organizations to put little beacons transmitters radio frequency transmitters on each ship they pinged out at a radius of about 50 miles, and a bit of information, a little packet of information about every 12 seconds that said, I'm here and I'm going over there at this speed. This is my name. This is the ship class I am, you know, hello. And then all the other ships would pick that signal up and then be better able to not hit that ship, not just relying on radar. Now, every ship carried a transmitter and a receiver. And what a small group of enthusiasts had realized around the world was if you leaned one of these passive transmitters against your flat window, overlooking uh, you know, the Gibraltar Straits, let's say, you could pick up every ship that was going through those straits. So it was a bit like a sort of ship spotting version of train spotting. Lloyds of London had, you know, to their credit, had a small group of folks who they obviously know about ships and ship insurance. They, just for fun, networked together all of these enthusiasts and set up this little collaborative group where if I plug in a transmitter, I get free access to everybody else's. I discovered this by just showing up at a meeting I shouldn't have even been at it was around shipping health and safety and I was covering for somebody and I was listening away about this new system that the shipping health and safety people were talking about and I had no real reason to even be there I was a trading analyst at the time 
And something in my brain just triggered. And I thought, what, what, you can tell if a ship's been to a jetty or a berth before. And therefore, when it comes to proving it to go there again, which is something we have to do in trading every single time to minimize incidents, you can help with the vetting process by going, oh, yeah, look, I can see the trail's been there six months ago. It's like, oh, that's really neat. And that's all their interest was. And I, I just asked a few idle questions around, well, how does this work? And whatever. One thing led to another. And I went to speak to Lloyd's and I realized to my utter shock, and it was one of those tingly stomach moments where it's like, what? You can see in real time where all the ships are in the world, wherever you have these antennas. It's like, oh my God, I, I think that's useful. So I went back and I talked to a few of the traders and stuff. And they're like, well, I don't know. Uh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. They, they couldn't, it was so maverick. They couldn't conceptualize it. I had just enough confidence uh, to badger my boss at the time to give me $20,000 of kind of R&D money. It's quite unusual, I have to say. Uh, but it basically shut me up. And I found in my free time, I was strict instructions to do it in my free time. I found a little company outside that were building a Google Maps type platform. This is even before Google Maps. Um, and I got them to build this system. I got a free download, you know, sort of free feed from uh, Lloyd's of this information. I tried to host it on our trader systems and I was told to go away unless I had a million dollars of internal budget to do it. Um, so I sweet talked the HR management team, actually in South Africa, all credit to you, uh, in South Africa, uh, uh, they were hosting the HR system, the intranet. And he went, oh, uh, yeah, fine, shove it on the side of that server, it doesn't really matter, it's not mission critical. Uh, as in, this is the HR portal, to be clear, it wasn't the employee records place, no, <laughs> don't get VP in trouble. Um, and anyway, I printed out the URL, I put it on the desks one late in the evening, went home. This is the big open plan trading floor at those times in Broadgate in central London. And um, anyway, went in the next day and there was just noise, everybody. People were walking around, they looked like crowding over desks. It went insane. I had essentially created a, a crystal ball to allow every commodity trader on every re in every region, we had a Singapore, Chicago, Houston, and London trading floors, to be able to essentially look about two weeks ahead of where all their cargoes were going. And it made well over half a billion dollars within the first sort of nine months of us uh, playing with it. Now, the good thing is as well, I should just add this, um, it actually opened up a huge amount of inefficiency and got rid of that in the commodity world. So all the participants within about six months have the same system. And you go on any trading floor now and you can use these systems and see where all the trade flows are going. But it, it took out a lot of chartering and trade flow inefficiency that otherwise was there. So yeah, that was, that was mad. I got to present to Lord Brown and the whole board and it catapulted my trading career. But yeah, that was, that was fun. 20 grand into about half a billion. Did that take a lot of guts at the time? Because obviously now you sort of uh, look back at it once you've done it. Um, and I see sometimes people looking at these types of stories and saying, yeah, luck. There, there's no luck here because it must require a certain level of, uh, there's a determination. There's a, I can't say it on this call. It would, it would be, <laughs> just do it. Let's uh, rephrase it. Uh, just do it. <laughs> we all know uh, what you mean. Please. Yeah, well, yeah, yes, well, I, 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 would, I, I, would, I, would, I would challenge you on the luck thing. No, I, I think with all these things, you need a bit of luck, right? Um, you know, for, for, I, I tried five or six other things, both in, in my company and inside my employer and outside, I, I tried. And they sort of drifted along and not really worked out. All sorts of random things. Um, I think you've just got to not let the setback stop you from trying. I think you've got to just keep experimenting. You've got to keep rolling that very large multi-sided dice of which there's only one of the many sides that is marked success. You've just got to keep going and not let the early failures put you back. You know, in BP, I tried a few things and I remember being, you know, the, the classic corporate thing, no, no criticism to them. What are you doing? That's just a waste of time. It's not work. Go back to the day job and stop wasting your time. I had that a few times, not only with that journey actually, but also with other failures. And they were right. I, I turned out I built something that hadn't worked and oh well, down. And I think the challenge in the corporate is to not keep beating those little failures out of your employees because they won't eventually stumble across the game-changing maverick dis you know, discovery. It's a balance though, because if they're doing something dangerous, doing, you know, if they're gonna potentially threaten the company's reputation, if they're gonna spend too much money, I was risking $20,000, right? Um, and the final one, if you're going to hurt anybody, obviously, critically, you shouldn't do that. Um, just apply the same risks. Otherwise, let the employee get on with it. You know what? They're probably going to do it in their evenings and free time anyway, like I did, because they're just passionate about the excitement, the tingle of going on that journey. But to the company's credit, I didn't see any of that half a billion, <laughs> to be clear. What advice do you have for the, the senior leadership? 
you know, because obviously they're massively important as enablers to try to create these entrepreneurs and these innovation and, and cultural revolutions that they, they read about, they want, and then they go and seem to do everything um, to go and make sure that that doesn't happen. What can they do? Yeah, it's difficult because I don't think you can get away from the fact that traditionally the senior leadership of large organizations have got there because they are reliable, you know, safe, stable, um, and, and very good at delivering the results that the market and shareholders require, right? That mindset is, is fortunately not one to go and just tear up the rule book and suddenly pivot and go that way, right? Because the company, because what I would have just said, that will probably mean that the company isn't around very long, right? But how do you pair, pair that up with allowing a percentage of the company's activity to be that exploratory R&D thing that every now and then gives birth to the Airbnb type mad revolution? Well, I've got a, I've got a solution, a, a semi-solution. There is an example of where this worked beautifully, and it's Lockheed Martin in the 1940s. Lockheed Martin were churning out Mustangs, right, for the war effort, and they were under strict instructions from their shareholders, in other words, the US government, to draw an analogy, you better not stop hitting those targets or we're potentially going to lose the war, right? That is your, um, that is your number one priority. But there's this thing called the gas turbine and the jet fighter. We know the Germans are working on it and we know the British are working on it. We sure as hell need America's first jet fighter. Go and build one of those as well, by the way. But don't lose sight of priority number one. Does this sound familiar? You know, achieve everything. Well, they came up with a solution and, and this is where the skunk works kind of phrase comes from, right? They built a tent alongside the production line outside the factory. They handpicked a couple of complete mavericks. So pick the employees that are already chomping at the bit to think like this. They pulled them off the production line where it didn't really have a material impact on the production. They gave them access to the production line expertise and materials. So every now and then you can pick something off the production line that again, isn't gonna to cause too much disruption. And they were allowed to play in the tent, right? And they had a, a, a slackening of all the normal rules. You know what, if you set fire to the tent, it's a tent, we can build another one, right? And they were given the freedom. And in something like 180 days, they went from nothing to building America's first jet fighter. I think most corporations need the skunk works tent. They don't want an incubator on the other side of the world where so the next leader that comes in goes, what the hell are they doing? Because no one's talked to them for six months. Let's cut it as an unnecessary cost. And you don't also want to try and in introduce some revolutionary innovative culture right at the core of the company. Because A, most of the employees are not brought up in that world and will not understand what it is. And B, if they go the other way and go too crazy, they'll take their eye off the ball and you'll have a safety or productivity incident, which will then close it down or shut down the company. So if you hold it just near enough where it gets access to expertise, but not so far away that it gets, you know, abandoned, it's the skunk works tent. And I think, you know, corporate leadership can try and identify where they can house, even just temporarily for a six month secondment, a few of the maverick thinkers and let them play with that inside knowledge of what, how the company operates now, but with enough freedom and access to the outside world to maybe challenge some of those ideas. What about, um, for the uh, probably, I don't want to put an age to it. The um, the new joiners, you know, of an organisation, the more junior members of an organisation, particularly the ones that like this idea of experimentation and entrepreneurship, they haven't um, they haven't had that kind of joy to learn and fail bashed out of them at uh, university or school. Yeah. What advice have you got for them so that they they get the balance? Because sometimes, and you see this often. I think the luck for your story is not that it succeeded, that you didn't get potentially fired. A lot of organizations don't yeah. like disruptors and they try to passively, let's say they passively exit them because they don't know how to handle them. And so yeah. we want these entrepreneurs in the corporate environment. How can they be that entrepreneur and, and still have a safe career where you know, they can get promoted? I, I would say the advice to them, and it sort of follows as well as relevant to the leadership, the, the advice to the junior folks is, Try and cling on to it, abide by those three rules, because it's very easy to do some damage to your corporate reputation by trying to do a funky new experiment somewhere and trampling over your delegations of authority or you know, the, the rules that are there for a good reason. I know all this as a trader. You had an awful lot of rules you had to abide by. Um, I, I would say find a corporate sponsor, find a leadership sponsor that you have a hunch is, is minded in a, sim, you know, in a similar way. You know, in any leadership team, you will have a sliding scale of those more conservatively minded and those more maverickly minded, if that's a word. Um, and I say as a, as a junior, without again, bypassing too many levels of leadership and upsetting your immediate management, um, see if you can get some way to connect with a bit of a corporate sponsor that will even over a coffee hear your idea. And then from their top down, make you some space to be maybe one of the occupiers of that tent I was describing. 
How important, again, question has come through. I'm slightly, uh, I'll, I'll find the name of the person that asked it, but how important has um, purpose, and specifically, I mean, um, this idea of purposeful leadership, conscious capitalism um, is becoming a term nowadays. This idea that most companies are fairly profit-minded, they're just driving for the bottom line to pay out dividend to their shareholders. How important for you on your journey has having a strong purpose been, which has transcended anything about money? And how important do you think this is becoming for, for corporates in general? Yeah, so I, I started out this journey, as I think I mentioned, with absolutely no idea of building it into a business. Um, I just did it genuinely 100% for the joy of the challenge. And obviously, as it started to work, I started, started to then challenge myself on how do I share this with some people for fun and see how it grows. And it was really hard to come up with the sort of gravity brand and package it in a way and launch it with Wired and Red Bull and all that stuff was actually really hard, but has worked very well. Um, but I was, was and still am 100% really driven by the joy of the journey. Um, I've heard wonderful interviews with people like Richard Branson and you know, Elon Musk. And uh, I mean, Bernie Eccleston, the guy who built the Formula One kind of dynasty. I remember hearing a great interview with him where somebody asked, look, you're a billionaire. Was that what drove you? And he was, no, um, he, he was driven by the, 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 the challenge of scaling that enterprise into an ever bigger thing, doing the deal with the new country and getting that country signed up for a race. And, and, and he, he was literally sort of tapped on the shoulder occasionally by his accountants. I know this is going to be a patronizing thing who, for, to people who want some more money at the stage of their life they're at. But he would literally be shown, by the way, it's all going quite well. And he, he just saw that as a measure of his success rather than the, the objective. And I think most businesses that are driven by, um, by, by the, the excitement of the journey will be more likely to be financially successful anyway. Um, and certainly this seems to be an enormous factor for young people nowadays. I, I, most of my team are half my age. And they are not driven by money. And I mean, I'm talking about the ones I pay as well. Um, they are predominantly driven by making sure that they're having fun, doing something cool and rewarding. And I think it's because the generation that's growing up now in their 20s, we've made it in most parts of the world impossible to buy any assets anyway. So they don't actually really value so much as my generation did uh, physical pro uh, objects anyway. So if they're sitting somewhere cool with a laptop on their lap, doing a bit of work that they can choose when they stop and then go off skating somewhere, that is vastly more important than, than just slaving away and you know buying a portion in 12 months time. It's amazing. So I, I think this is a really cool thing. It should drive businesses into re re you know, reflecting and respecting that and make work less of the classic, you know, um, a battery chicken environment and more of a joyful place to be. Do you have a theory why purposeful organizations are inspiring their people more than sort of profit driven organizations? Oh, because I mean, you know, this is assuming that the purposeful organizations are paying a fair wage. Actually, you know, isn't it amazing when you do go to work, even in, in the most boring corporate job, there are times when you go in because you're really excited about this particular project or this particular day you're getting a result of something. Those days when you get up and you think, oh, I'm excited to go in today. And I know it's sad that a lot of people in corporate roles don't often feel that, but look at the difference in your energy level. You know, you look at the clock and think, oh my God, is that where the time's gone? That's been awesome. I, I, there's loads more I want to do. I'll, I'll take it home with me because I'm really excited about it. You know, the energy and passion and commitment and productivity of people who are enjoying doing what they're doing is off the scale compared to people who are just clock watching and hating what they do. You do a lot of um, these types of Zoom calls, especially now while the shows have ground to a halt and you've had massive numbers of interactions in your uh, working career. Although this is a working career, I don't know what to call it. It's entrepreneurial career, I guess. It kind of is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> who, which companies would you like to highlight as, you know, think that... Um, are as close to the ethos that, that you're talking about um, as they can be, considering they might be listed or sizable? I, I mean, it, it's unfair to pick, you know, it, a lot of even quite large technology companies still are enjoying the relative recent glow of their founder or their, their mission. So all the Facebooks and the Googles, you know, and the SpaceXs and all of these, you know, you almost have a, often in these companies, a level of, passion for the leader and their mission that's emerging on the cultish <laughs> um, which you know as long as it's kept healthy I think is amazing I mean the people you know you meet anybody who works for SpaceX and I mean they, they sort of read they, they glow <laughs> in telling you that they're working for SpaceX and they're part of the sincere mission to get humanity to Mars I mean how cool is that um, 
I think it's very hard for the majority of industries and, and businesses that are doing critical things, you know, like, I, I don't know, manufacturing, I don't know, mattresses. <laughs> you know, that's still really important, right? But it's been going on for a while and it's quite hard to make it sexy. Um, but I still think it's possible to, you know, uh, to, to ge you know, generate that buzzy kind of feeling. Actually, but it, it, example but is it is hard to find. Mention. That's so, a really good example. I forget the name of the company. I'll send everyone afterwards and, and you the link. There is actually a company in the US that's managed to do that. They've turned the manufacture and sale of mattresses into the coolest, sexiest, most exciting entrepreneurial company that you've ever be seen. Because, because they set themselves a purpose statement um, to go and improve health of their customers. They do not make mattresses. That's just one of the products which they yeah. thought would be a really cool way to improve people's you know, mental health. So I'll send you Brilliant. that because it's a really, really good example. Sorry, so, you I, know, I think it's, it, yeah, no, that's great. Well, I just randomly picked mattresses, so how funny. Um, it is hard in older industries to find examples. Um, you know, I, I, the, the younger companies, the tech companies and stuff are better examples. Um, and also I think there is inevitably something about when you're in a more mature industry, you've got smaller margins, there's much steeper competition. Everybody's fighting for that incremental small growth or even just maintaining scale. Therefore, the time you've got to go and buy, you know, pool, you know, bean bags and, and pool tables, and everybody give each other big hugs, and you know, think about new breaking, you know, new, you know, breakthroughs and stuff. It's really hard. I completely, you know, admit that. Maybe the solution there is actually you have a culture alongside the business of just really respecting and the well-being of your employees. So I saw a great documentary recently about Kellogg's and how the uh, original story of Kellogg's was pretty cool, um, how they have this very um, you know, family orientated ethos and there's a factory up in the UK where they had this documentary. And I mean, there was like three generations of families working there. And I mean, they, you know, it's working on a, on a breakfast cereal production line and yet they were so passionate and believed in what they were doing. It was wonderful. I think that's a great example of where, look, it's, it's a tough business to be in. There's not massive margins. It's not exactly that exciting, although they got very excited about the invention of the Cocoa Pop not that long ago, a few decades ago and things like that. Um, if they can do it, for goodness sake, I think other industries can look at that and, you know, and, and buck up their ideas and try and make their employees smile a bit more often. All right, we've got about two and a half minutes left. So uh, two quick questions and then a, and a longer one. Um, how much is one of your suits if anyone wants to buy one on the call? So yeah, we've sold a couple. We, we don't really like selling them, if I'm really honest. We sold a couple for about £340,000. So that's about, uh, uh, hang on, so $340,000, sorry. Um, so US dollars, that is. Yeah, um, not our main, yeah, so our main, our main thing though, really, and um, we've done this with about 50 or 60 people, is that you can show up, uh, have a look around the lab, see some flight demonstrations. Um, and we just put out a video with uh, this famous Bollywood star I was telling you about where we had him over. Um, that's going kind of crazy on uh, YouTube at the moment. But um, uh, we clip you into a little tether so it's entirely safe and you go through progressively the levels of power and some people learn it within even half a day. They look up, grin like an idiot and fly around. You're on a safety tether so you can't fall over. Um, training and learning to do it and, uh, and then showing up and we make the, the gear available and even eventually joining us for the race series. Uh, we were supposed to do our first one in Bermuda in March. It's all on pause at the moment. But that as a model is, is kind of better because back to the regulators, I don't really want to be selling these to loads of people. It'd be like buying a Formula One car. It would be better to just come and hang out with us and learn to fly them and at least do that first. But yeah, we've sold a couple. Um, where can people find out more about you? Where can they follow you? Where can they interact with you and your uh, colleagues? So, I mean, the website is gravity.co, so gravity.co. If you want to inquire about coming and learning to fly here or in LA, where we do it there usually, and we're going to set up more locations around the world, it is a mind-blowing experience for teams or individuals. Um, email through the experience at gravity.co email address that you'll find on that website, the inquiry form. Mostly, though, I would really highly recommend, if I may, uh, our YouTube channel. If you look for Gravity Industries, and I think you're going to kindly share this later, Gravity Industries on YouTube. Um, I'm using this wonderful downtime we have to dig out a lot of our old footage to really show behind the scenes. So some of the funny stuff, some of the fails and some of the amazing journeys we've been on with the military and events around the world, but also Instagram and other social media platforms. If you look for all of the rest at Take On Gravity, I'm fighting gravity, Take On Gravity, then you'll see um, a, a lot on uh, things like Instagram. Awesome, Richard. I just want to really thank you on behalf of, uh, well, certainly myself and all the attendees. Absolutely fascinating. I wish we could have had another hour or two. Um, 
there's definitely a book in there in terms of your suggestions around experiment. Oh, you've written one. Would you like to just quickly mention that? Well, I, 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 it was ghost written and I had the trauma of going through and almost rewriting the whole thing again because it wasn't quite right. But anyway, um, that should have been out Father's Day this year. But thanks to the good old virus, uh, the publishing industry has gone on freeze. So um, yes, the book, um, if, you, if you look for Richard Browning or Taking on Gravity, uh, similar to the social media handle, um, is uh, there for pre-order, but it's going to be released in 2021 now. That takes you from my childhood, kind of where did the innovation thing come from? I've touched on some of that now uh, in this talk, um, uh, right through to when we launched the company and did the first few events and raised half a million dollars from the Drapers by mistake before TED 2017. And there's all of this stuff in there. Um, but yes, I'd like to think we could potentially do a bit of a business related element to it as well at the rate we're going. But uh, yeah, that, 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 that will be out there um, yeah, next year. Awesome. Richard, thank you very much. Eh? Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks,